Section One of Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral by Phyllis Wheatley, Negro Servant to Mr. John Wheatley of Boston in New England. To the Right Honourable the Countess of Huntingdon, the following poems are most respectfully inscribed, by her much obliged, very humble and devoted servant, Phyllis Wheatley. Boston, June 12th, 1773. Preface the following poems were written originally for the amusement of the author, as they were the products of her leisure moments. She had no intention ever to have published them, nor would they now have made their appearance, but at the importunity of many of her best and most generous friends, to whom she considers herself as under the greatest obligations. As her attempts in poetry are now sent into the world, it is hoped the critic will not severely censure their defects and we presume they have too much merit to be cast aside with contempt as worthless and trifling effusions. As to the disadvantages she has laboured under with regard to learning, nothing needs to be offered, as her master's letter in the following page will sufficiently show the difficulties in this respect she had to encounter. With all their imperfections, the poems are now humbly submitted to the perusal of the public. The following is a copy of a letter, sent by the author's master to the publisher. Phyllis was brought from Africa to America in the year 1761, between seven and eight years of age. Without any assistance from school education, and by only what she was taught in the family, she, in sixteen months' time from her arrival, attained the English language, to which she was an utter stranger before, to such a degree as to read any the most difficult parts of the sacred writings, to the great astonishment of all who heard her. As to her writing, her own curiosity led her to it, and this she learned in so short a time, that in the year 1765 she wrote a letter to the Reverend Mr. Ockham, the Indian minister, while in England. She has a great inclination to learn the Latin tongue, and has made some progress in it. This relation is given by her master who bought her, and with whom she now lives. John Wheatley, Boston, November 14th, 1772. To the Public As it has been repeatedly suggested to the publisher, by persons who have seen the manuscript, that numbers would be ready to suspect that they were not really the writings of Phyllis, he has procured the following attestation, from the most respectable characters in Boston, that none might have the least ground for disputing their original. We, whose names are underwritten, do assure the world that the poems specified in the following pages were, as we verily believe, written by Phyllis, a young negro girl, who was but a few years since brought an uncultivated barbarian from Africa, and has ever since been, and now is, under the disadvantage of serving as a slave in a family in this town. She has been examined by some of the best judges, and is thought qualified to write them. His Excellency Thomas Hutchinson, Governor, the Honorable Andrew Oliver, Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Thomas Hubbard, the Reverend Charles Chauncey, the Honorable John Irving, the Reverend Mather Biles, the Honorable James Pitts, the Reverend Ed Pemberton, the Honorable Harrison Gray, the Reverend Andrew Elliot, the Honorable James Bowden, the Reverend Samuel Cooper, John Hancock, Esquire the Rev. Mr. Samuel Mather, Joseph Green, Esquire, the Rev. Mr. John Moorhead, Richard Carey, Esquire, Mr. John Wheatley, her master. N.B. The original attestation, signed by the above gentleman, may be seen by applying to Archibald Bell, bookseller, No. 8, Aldgate Street. End of section 1
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, by Phyllis Wheatley. To Messenus. Messenus, you beneath the myrtle shade, read o'er what poets sung and shepherds played. What felt those poets but you feel the same? Does not your soul possess the sacred flame? Their noble strains your equal genius shares in softer language and diviner airs. While Homer paints, lo, circumfused in air, celestial gods in mortal forms appear. Swift as they move, here each recess rebound, heaven quakes, earth trembles, and the shores resound. Great sire of verse, before my mortal eyes the lightnings blaze across the vaulted skies, and as the thunder shakes the heavenly plains, a deep-felt horror thrills through all my veins. When gentler strains demand thy graceful song, the lengthening line moves languishing along. When great Patroclus courts Achilles' aid, the grateful tribute of my tears is paid. Prone on the shore he feels the pangs of love, and stern Pelides' tenderest passions move. Great Maro's strain in heavenly numbers flows, the nine inspire, and all the bosom glows. O oh, could I rival thine and Virgil's page, or claim the muses with the Mantuan sage? Soon the same beauties should my mind adorn, and the same ardours in my soul should burn. Then should my song in bolder notes arise, and all my numbers pleasingly surprise. But here I sit, and mourn a grovelling mind, that fain would mount and ride upon the wind. Not you, my friend, these plaintive strains become, not you, whose bosom is the muse's home. When they from towering Helicon retire, they fan in you the bright immortal fire. But I, less happy, cannot raise the song. The faltering music dies upon my tongue. The happier Terence all the choir inspired, his soul replenished and his bosom fired. But say, ye muses, why this partial grace to one alone of Afric's sable race, from age to age transmitting thus his name with the finest glory in the rolls of fame? Thy virtues, great Messenus, shall be sung in praise of him from whom those virtues sprung. While blooming wreaths around thy temples spread, I'll snatch a laurel from thine honoured head, while you indulgent smile upon the deed. As long as Thames in streams majestic flows, or naiads in their oozy beds repose, while Phoebus reigns above the starry train, while bright aurora purples o'er the main, so long, great sir, the muse thy praise shall sing, so long thy praise shall make Parnassus ring. Then grant, Messenus, thy paternal rays, hear me propitious, and defend my lays. On Virtue O oh, thou bright jewel, in my aim I strive to comprehend thee. Thine own words declare wisdom is higher than a fool can reach. I cease to wonder, and no more attempt thine height to explore or fathom thy profound. But, O oh, my soul, sink not into despair. Virtue is near thee, and with gentle hand would now embrace thee, hovers o'er thine head. Fain would the heaven-born soul with her converse, then seek, then court her for her promised bliss. Auspicious queen, thine heavenly pinion spread, and lead celestial chastity along. Lo, now her sacred retinue descends, arrayed in glory from the orbs above, Attend me, virtue, throw my youthful years. O oh, leave me not to the false joys of time. 
but guide my steps to endless life and bliss. Greatness or goodness, say what I shall call thee, to give me an higher appellation still. Teach me a better strain, a nobler lay, O thou, enthroned with cherubs in the realms of day. To the University of Cambridge in New England while an intrinsic ardour prompts to write, The muses promise to assist my pen. T'was not long since I left my native shore, The land of errors and Egyptian gloom. Father of mercy, t'was thy gracious hand Brought me in safety from those dark abodes. Students, to you tis given to scan the heights above, To traverse the ethereal space, and mark the systems of revolving worlds. Still more, ye sons of science, ye receive the blissful news by messengers from heaven, how Jesus' blood for your redemption flows. See him with hands outstretched upon the cross, immense compassion in his bosom glows. He hears revilers nor resents their scorn. What matchless mercy in the Son of God! When the whole human race by sin had fallen, He deigned to die that they might rise again, And share with him in the sublimest skies Life without death and glory without end. Improve your privileges while they stay, ye pupils, And each hour redeem that bears or good or bad Report of you to heaven. Let sin, that baneful evil to the soul, By you be shunned, nor once remit your guard, suppress the deadly serpent in its egg. Ye blooming plants of human race divine, an Ethiop tells you tis your greatest foe, its transient sweetness turns to endless pain, and in immense perdition sinks the soul. To the King's Most Excellent Majesty, 1768 your subjects hope, dread sire, the crown upon your brows may flourish long, and that your arm may in your God be strong. O oh, may your sceptre numerous nations sway, and all with love and readiness obey. But how shall we the British king reward? Rule thou in peace, our father and our lord. Mit the remembrance of thy favours past, the meanest peasants most admire the last. May George, beloved by all the nations round, Live with heaven's choicest constant blessings crowned. Great God, direct and guard him from on high, And from his head let every evil fly, And may each climb with equal gladness see, A monarch's smile can set his subjects free. On being brought from Africa to America. T'was mercy brought me from my pagan land, Taught my benighted soul to understand That there's a God, that there's a Saviour too. Once I redemption neither fought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, Their colour is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. On the Death of the Reverend Dr. Sewell, 1769 Ere yet the morn its lovely blushes spread, See Sewell numbered with the happy dead. Hail, holy man, arrived the immortal shore, Though we shall hear thy warning voice no more. Come. Let us all behold with wishful eyes The saint ascending to his native skies. From hence the prophet winged his rapturous way To the blessed mansions in eternal day. Then, begging for the spirit of our God, And panting eager for the same abode, Come, let us all with the same vigour rise, And take a prospect of the blissful skies. While on our minds Christ's image is impressed, and the dear Saviour glows in every breast. Thrice happy faint, to find thy heaven at last, What compensation for the evils past! Great God, incomprehensible, 
unknown by sense, we bow at thine exalted throne. O, oh, while we beg thine excellence to feel, thy sacred spirit to our hearts reveal, and give us of that mercy to partake, which thou hast promised for the Saviour's sake. Sewell is dead. Swift pinioned fame thus cried. Is Sewell dead? my trembling tongue replied. O, oh, what a blessing in his flight denied! How oft for us the holy prophet prayed, How oft to us the word of life conveyed! By duty urged my mournful verse to close, I for his tomb this epitaph compose. Lo, here a man, redeemed by Jesus' blood, A sinner once, but now a saint with God. Behold, ye rich, ye poor, ye fools, ye wise, Nor let this monument your heart surprise, T'will tell you what this holy man has done, Which gives him brighter lustre than the sun. Listen, ye happy, from your seats above, I speak sincerely, while I speak and love, He fought the paths of piety and truth, By these made happy from his early youth, In blooming years that grace divine he felt, Which rescues sinners from the chains of guilt. Mourn him, ye indigent, whom he has fed, and henceforth seek like him for living bread, even Christ the bread descending from above, and ask an interest in his saving love. Mourn him, ye youth, to whom he oft has told God's gracious wonders from the times of old. I too have caused this mighty loss to mourn, for he my monitor will not return. O oh, when shall we to his blessed state arrive? when the same graces in our bosoms thrive. On the Death of the Rev. Mr. George Whitefield, 1770 Hail, happy saint, on thine immortal throne, Possessed of glory, life, and bliss unknown, We hear no more the music of thy tongue, Thy wonted auditories cease to throng, Thy sermons in unequalled accents flowed, and every bosom with devotion glowed. Thou didst in strains of eloquence refined inflame the heart and captivate the mind. Unhappy we the setting sun deplore, so glorious once, but ah, it shines no more. Behold the prophet in his towering flight, he leaves the earth for heaven's unmeasured height, and worlds unknown receive him from our sight. There Whitefield wings with rapid course his way, And sails to Zion through vast seas of day. Thy prayers, great saint, and thine incessant cries Have pierced the bosom of thy native skies. Thou moon hast seen, and all the stars of light, How he has wrestled with his God by night. He prayed that grace in every heart might dwell. He longed to see America excel, he charged its youth that every grace divine Should with full lustre in their conduct shine. That Saviour which his soul did first receive, The greatest gift that even a God can give, He freely offered to the numerous throng, That on his lips with listening pleasure hung. Take him, ye wretched, for your only good, Take him, ye starving sinners, for your food. Ye thirsty, come to this life-giving stream, Ye preachers, take him for your joyful theme. Take him, my dear Americans, he said, Be your complaints on his kind bosom laid. Take him, ye Africans, he longs for you, Impartial Saviour is his title due. Washed in the fountain of redeeming blood, You shall be sons and kings and priests to God. Great Countess, we Americans revere thy name, And mingle in thy grief sincere. New England deeply feels, the orphans mourn, their more than father will no more return. But, though arrested by the hand of death, Whitefield no more exerts his labouring breath, yet let us view him in the eternal skies, let every heart to this bright vision rise, while the tomb safe retains its sacred trust, till life divine reanimates his dust. ON THE DEATH OF A YOUNG LADY OF FIVE YEARS OF AGE From dark abodes to fair ethereal light, Then raptured innocent has winged her flight. On the kind bosom of eternal love, 
she finds unknown beatitude above. This known, ye parents, nor her loss deplore, she feels the iron hand of pain no more. The dispensations of unerring grace should turn your sorrows into grateful praise. Let then no tears for her henceforward flow, no more distressed in our dark veil below. Her morning sun, which rose divinely bright, was quickly mantled with the gloom of night. But here in heaven's blessed bowers your Nancy fair, and learn to imitate her language there. Thou, Lord, whom I behold with glory crowned, by what sweet name, and in what tuneful sound wilt thou be praised? Seraphic powers are faint, infinite love and majesty to paint. To thee let all their graceful voices raise, and saints and angels join their songs of praise. Perfect in bliss, she from her heavenly home looks down, and smiling beckons you to come. Why then, fond parents, why these fruitless groans? Restrain your tears, and cease your plaintive moans. Freed from a world of sin and snares and pain, why would you wish your daughter back again? No, bow resigned. Let hope your grief control, and check the rising tumult of the soul. Calm in the prosperous and adverse day, Adore the God who gives and takes away. I him in all, his holy name revere, Upright your actions and your hearts sincere, Till having sailed through life's tempestuous sea, And from its rocks and boisterous billows free, Yourselves, safe landed on the blissful shore, Shall join your happy babe to part no more. On the Death of a Young Gentleman who taught thee conflict with the powers of night, To vanquish Satan in the fields of light? Who strung thy feeble arms with might unknown? How great thy conquest, and how bright thy crown! War with each princedom, throne, and power is o'er, The scene is ended to return no more. O oh, could my muse thy seat on high behold! How decked with laurel, how enriched with gold! O oh, could she hear what praise thine harp employs, How sweet thine anthems, how divine thy joys! What heavenly grandeur should exalt her strain, What holy raptures in her numbers reign, To soothe the troubles of the mind to peace, To still the tumult of life's tossing seas, To ease the anguish of the parent's heart, What shall my sympathizing verse impart? Where is the balm to heal so deep a wound? Where shall a sovereign remedy be found? Look, gracious spirit, from thine heavenly bower, And thy full joys into their bosoms pour, The raging tempest of their grief control, And spread the dawn of glory through the soul, To eye the path the saint departed trod, And trace him to the bosom of his God. TO A LADY ON THE DEATH OF HER HUSBAND Grim monarch, see, deprived of vital breath, A young physician in the dust of death. Dost thou go on incessant to destroy Our griefs to double, and lay waste our joy? Enough, though never yet was known to say, Though millions die, the vassals of thy sway, nor youth, nor science, nor the ties of love, Nor aught on earth thy flinty heart can move. The friend, the spouse, from his dire dart to save, In vain we ask the sovereign of the grave. Fair mourner, there see thy loved Leonard laid, And o'er him spread the deep impervious shade. Closed are his eyes, and heavy fetters keep His senses bound in never-waking sleep, Till time shall cease, till many a starry world Shall fall from heaven, in dire confusion hurled, Till nature in her final wreck shall lie, And her last groan shall rend the azure sky. Not, not till then his active soul shall claim His body, a divine, immortal frame. But see the softly stealing tears apace Pursue each other down the mourner's face. But cease thy tears, Bid every sigh depart, 
and cast the load of anguish from thine heart. From the cold shell of his great soul arise, and look beyond, thou native of the skies. There fix thy view, where fleeter than the wind thy leonard mounts and leaves the earth behind. Thyself prepare to pass the veil of night, to join for ever on the hills of light. To thine embrace this joyful spirit moves to thee, the partner of his earthly loves. He welcomes thee to pleasures more refined, and better suited to the mortal mind. End of section 2《Section 3 of Poems on Various Subjects》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral By Phyllis Wheatley Goliath of Gath, 1 Samuel, Chapter 17 Ye martial powers, and all ye tuneful nine, Inspire my song, and aid my high design. The dreadful scenes and toils of war I write, The ardent warriors and the fields of fight. You best remember, and you best can sing, The acts of heroes to the vocal string. Resume the lays with which your sacred lyre Did then the poet and the sage inspire. Now front to front the armies were displayed, Here Israel ranged, and there the foes arrayed. The hosts on two opposing mountains stood, Thick as the foliage of the waving wood. Between them an extensive valley lay, O'er which the gleaming armor poured the day, When from the camp of the Philistine foes, Dreadful to view, a mighty warrior rose. In the dire deeds of bleeding battle skilled, The monster stalks the terror of the field. From Gath he sprung, Goliath was his name, Of fierce deportment and gigantic frame. A brazen helmet on his head was placed, A coat of mail his form terrific graced. The greaves his legs, the targe his shoulders pressed, Dreadful in arms high towering o'er the rest, a spear he proudly waved, whose iron head, strange to relate, six hundred shekels weighed. He strode along and shook the ample field, while Phoebus blazed refulgent on his shield. Through Jacob's race a chilling horror ran, when thus the huge enormous chief began. Say, what the cause that in this proud array you set your battle in the face of day, one hero find in all your vaunting train, Then see who loses and who wins the plain. For he who wins in triumph may demand Perpetual service from the vanquished land. Your armies I defy, your force despise, By far inferior in Philistia's eyes. Produce a man, and let us try the fight, Decide the contest and the victor's right. Thus challenged he, all Israel stood amazed, And every chief in consternation gazed. But Jesse's son in youthful bloom appears, And warlike courage far beyond his years. He left the folds, he left the flowery meads, And soft recesses of the sylvan shades. Now Israel's monarch and his troops arise, With peals of shouts ascending to the skies, in Ella's vale the scene of combat lies. When the fair morning blushed with orient red, What David's fire enjoined the sun obeyed, And swift of foot towards the trench he came, Where glowed each bosom with the martial flame. He leaves his carriage to another's care, And runs to greet his brethren of the war. While yet they spake the giant chief arose, Repeats the challenge and insults his foes, Struck with the sound, and trembling at the view, Affrighted Israel from its post withdrew. Observe ye this tremendous foe, they cried, Who in proud vaunts our armies hath defied. Whoever lays him prostrate on the plain, Freedom in Israel for his house shall gain, And on him wealth unknown the king will pour, And give his royal daughter for his dower. Then Jesse's youngest hope, 
My brethren, say, what shall be done for him who takes away reproach from Jacob, who destroys the chief, and puts a period to his country's grief? He vaunts the honours of his arms abroad, and scorns the armies of the living God. Thus spoke the youth. The tentive people eyed the wondrous hero, and again replied, Such the rewards our monarch will bestow on him who conquers and destroys his foe. Eliab heard, and kindled into ire to hear his shepherd brother thus inquire, and thus began, What errand brought thee? Say, who keeps thy flock? Or does it go astray? I know the base ambition of thine heart, but back in safety from the field depart. Eliab thus to Jesse's youngest heir expressed his wrath in accents most severe, when to his brother mildly he replied, What have I done? or what the cause to chide. The words were told before the king, who sent for the young hero to his royal tent. Before the monarch dauntless he began, For this Philistine fail no heart of man. I'll take the veil, and with the giant fight. I dread not all his boasts, nor all his might. When thus the king, Darest thou a stripling go, and venture combat with so great a foe? who all his days hath been inured to fight, and made its deeds his study and delight? Battles and bloodshed brought the monster forth, and clouds and whirlwinds ushered in his birth. When David thus, I kept the fleecy care, and out there rushed a lion and a bear, a tender lamb the hungry lion took, and with no other weapon than my crook bold I pursued, and chased him o'er the field, the prey delivered and the felon killed, as thus the lion and the bear I slew, so shall Goliath fall, and all his crew. The God who saved me from these beasts of prey, by me this monster in the dust shall lay. So David spoke. The wondering king replied, Go thou with heaven, and victory on thy side. This coat of mail, this sword gird on, he said, and placed a mighty helmet on his head. The coat, the sword, the helm he laid aside, nor chose to venture with those arms untried. Then took his staff, and to the neighbouring brook instant he ran, and thence five pebbles took. Meantime descended to Philistia's son, a radiant cherub, and thus he began. Goliath, well thou knowest thou hast defied yon Hebrew armies, and their god denied. Rebellious wretch, audacious worm! Forbear, nor tempt the vengeance of their God too far. Them who with his omnipotence contend, No eye shall pity and no arm defend. Proud as thou art, in short-lived glory great, I come to tell thee thine approaching fate. Regard my words, the judge of all the gods, Beneath whose steps the towering mountain nods, Will give thine armies to the savage brood, That cut the liquid air or range the wood. Thee, too, a well-aimed pebble shall destroy, and thou shalt perish by a beardless boy. Such is the mandate from the realms above, and should I try the vengeance to remove, myself a rebel to my king would prove. Goliath, say, shall grace to him be shown who dares heaven's monarch and insults his throne? Your words are lost on me, the giant cries, while fear and wrath contended in his eyes. When thus the messenger from heaven replies, Provoke no more Jehovah's awful hand To hurl its vengeance on thy guilty land. He grasps the thunder, and he wings the storm, Servants their sovereign's orders to perform. The angel spoke, and turned his eyes away, Adding new radiance to the rising day. Now David comes, the fatal stones demand his left, The staff engaged his better hand. The giant moved, and from his towering height surveyed the stripling, and disdained the fight, and thus began. Am I a dog with thee? Bringst thou no armour but a staff to me? The gods on thee their volleyed curses pour, and beasts and birds of prey thy flesh devour. David undaunted thus, Thy spear and shield shall no protection to thy body yield. Jehovah's name, no other arms I bear, I ask no other in this glorious war. 
To-day the Lord of hosts to me will give victory, To-day thy doom thou shalt receive. The fate you threaten shall your own become, And beasts shall be your animated tomb, That all the earth's inhabitants may know That there's a God who governs all below. This great assembly too shall witness stand, That needs nor sword nor spear the Almighty's hand. The battle his, the conquest he bestows, And to our power consigns our hated foes. Thus David spoke. Goliath heard and came to meet the hero in the field of fame. Ah, fatal meeting to thy troops and thee! But thou wast deaf to the divine decree. Young David meets thee, meets thee not in vain, Tis thine to perish on the sanguined plain. And now the youth a forceful pebble slung, Philistia trembled as it whizzed along. In his dread forehead were the helmet ends, Just o'er the brows the well-aimed stone descends. It pierced the skull, and shattered all the brain, Prone on his face he tumbled to the plain. Goliath's fall no smaller terror yields Than riving thunders in aerial fields. The soul still lingered in its loved abode, Till conquering David o'er the giant strode. Goliath's sword then laid its master dead, and from the body he hewed the ghastly head. The blood in gushing torrents drenched the plains, the soul found passage through the spouting veins. And now aloud the illustrious victor said, Where are your boastings now your champions dead? Scarce had he spoke, when the Philistines fled, but fled in vain, the conqueror swift pursued. What scenes of slaughter, and what seas of blood, there Saul thy thousands grasped them purpled sand In pangs of death the conquest of thine hand, And David there were thy ten thousands laid. Thus Israel's damsels musically played. Near Gath and Edron many an hero lay, Breathed out their souls and cursed the light of day. Their fury quenched by death no longer burns, And David with Goliath's head returns, To Salem brought. But in his tent he placed the load of armour which the giant graced. His monarch saw him coming from the war, and thus demanded of the son of Ner. "'Say, who is this amazing youth?' he cried, when thus the leader of the host replied, "'As lives thy soul I know not whence he sprung, so great in prowess though in years so young.' "'Inquire whose son he is,' the sovereign said, before whose conquering arm Philistia fled. Before the king behold the stripling stand, Goliath's head depending from his hand. To him the king. Say, of what martial line art thou, young hero, and what sire was thine? He humbly thus. The son of Jesse I. I came the glories of the field to try. Small is my tribe, but valiant in the fight. Small is my city, but thy royal right. Then take the promised gifts, the monarch cried, Conferring riches and the royal bride. Knit to my soul for ever thou remain with me, Nor quit my regal roof again. Thoughts on the Works of Providence Arise, my soul, on wings enraptured, Rise to praise the monarch of the earth and skies, whose goodness and beneficence appear as round its centre moves the rolling year. Or when the morning glows with rosy charms, or the sun slumbers in the ocean's arms. Of light divine be a rich portion lent to guide my soul and favour my intent. Celestial muse, my arduous flight sustain, and raise my mind to a seraphic strain. Adored for ever be the God unseen, which round the sun revolves this vast machine, Though to his eye its mass a point appear, Adored the God that whirls surrounding spheres, Which first ordained that mighty Saul should reign The peerless monarch of the ethereal train. Of miles twice forty millions is his height, And yet his radiance dazzles mortal sight So far beneath, from him the extended earth Vigour derives, and every flowery birth. Vast through her orb she moves with easy grace, Around her Phoebus in unbounded space. 
True to her course the impetuous storm derides, Triumphant o'er the winds and surging tides. Almighty, in these wondrous works of thine, What power, what wisdom, and what goodness shine! And are thy wonders, Lord, by men explored, And yet creating glory unadored? Creation smiles in various beauty gay, While day to night and night succeeds to day. That wisdom which attends Jehovah's ways Shines most conspicuous in the solar rays. Without them, destitute of heat and light, This world would be the reign of endless night. In their excess how would our race complain, A boring life, how hate its lengthened chain! From air a dust what numerous ills would rise, What dire contagion taint the burning skies! What pestilential vapours fraught with death Would rise and overspread the lands beneath! Hail, smiling morn, that from the orient main Ascending dust adorn the heavenly plain! So rich, so various are thy beauteous dyes, that spread through all the circuit of the skies, That full of thee my soul in rapture soars, And thy great God the cause of all adores. Or beings infinite his love extends, His wisdom rules them, and his power defends. When tasks diurnal tire the human frame, The spirits faint, and dim the vital flame. Then too that ever active bounty shines, which not infinity of space confines. The sable veil that night in silence draws, Conceals effects but shows the almighty cause. Night seals in sleep the wide creation fair, And all is peaceful but the brow of care. Again gay Phoebus as the day before, Wakes every eye, but what shall wake no more? Again the face of nature is renewed, which still appears harmonious, fair, and good. May grateful strains salute the smiling morn, Before its beams the eastern hills adorn. Shall day to day and night to night conspire To show the goodness of the Almighty Sire? This mental voice shall man regardless hear, And never, never raise the filial prayer? To day, O oh, hearken, nor your folly mourn, For time misspent that never will return. But see the suns of vegetation rise, And spread their leafy banners to the skies. All wise almighty providence we trace In trees and plants and all the flowery race, As clear as in the nobler frame of man, All lovely copies of the Maker's plan, The power the same that forms a ray of light, That called creation from eternal night. Let there be light, he said, from his profound old chaos heard and trembled at the sound. Swift as the word, inspired by power divine, behold the light around its maker shine, the first fair product of the omnific God, and now through all his works diffused abroad. As reason's powers by day our God disclose, so we may trace him in the night's repose. Say what is sleep, and dreams how passing strange, when action ceases and ideas range licentious and unbounded o'er the plains, Where fancy's queen in giddy triumph reigns, Here in soft strains the dreaming lover sigh To a kind fair, or rave in jealousy. On pleasure now, and now on vengeance bent, The labouring passions struggle for a vent. What power, O oh man, thy reason then restores, So long suspended in nocturnal hours? What secret hand returns the mental train, And gives improved thine active powers again? From thee, O oh man, what gratitude should rise! And when from balmy sleep thou op'st thine eyes, Let thy first thoughts be praises to the skies. How merciful our God, who thus imparts O'erflowing tides of joy to human hearts, When wants and woes might be our righteous lot, Our God forgetting, by our God forgot. Among the mental powers a question rose, What most the image of the eternal shows? When thus to reason, so let fancy rove, Her great companion spoke immortal love. Say, mighty power, how long shall strife prevail, And with its murmurs load the whispering gale? 
Refer the cause to recollection's shrine, Who loud proclaims my origin divine. The cause whence heaven and earth began to be, And is not man immortalized by me? Reason let this most causeless strife subside. Thus love pronounced, and reason thus replied. Thy birth, celestial queen, tis mine to own, In thee resplendent is the Godhead shown, Thy words persuade, my soul enraptured feels Resistless beauty which thy smile reveals. Ardent she spoke, and kindling at her charms, She clasped the blooming goddess in her arms. Infinite love, where'er we turn our eyes, appears, This every creature's want supplies. This most is heard in nature's constant voice, This makes the morn, and this the eve rejoice. This bids the fostering rains and dews descend To nourish all, to serve one general end, The good of man. Yet man ungrateful pays but little homage, And but little praise. To him, whose works arrayed with mercy shine, What song should rise, how constant, how divine! To a Lady on the Death of Three Relations we trace the power of death from tomb to tomb, And his are all the ages yet to come. Tis his to call the planets from on high, To blacken Phoebus, and dissolve the sky. His too when all in his dark realms are hurled, From its firm base to shake the solid world. His fatal sceptre rules the spacious whole, And trembling nature rocks from pole to pole. Awful he moves, and wide his wings are spread. Behold thy brother numbered with the dead. From bondage freed, the exulting spirit flies Beyond Olympus and these starry skies. Lost in our woe for thee, blessed shade, We mourn in vain. To earth thou never must return. Thy sisters too, fair mourner, feel the dart of death, And with fresh torture rend thine heart. Weep not for them, and leave the world behind. As a young plant by hurricanes uptorn, So near its parent lies the newly born. But midst the bright ethereal train, behold, It shines superior on a throne of gold. Then, mourner, cease, let hope thy tears restrain, Smile on the tomb and soothe the raging pain. On yon blest regions fix thy longing view, Mindless of sublunary scenes below, Ascend the sacred mount, in thought arise, And seek substantial and immortal joys. Where hope receives, where faith to vision springs, And raptured seraphs tune the mortal strings To strains ecstatic. Thou the chorus join, and to thy father Tune the praise divine. TO A CLERGYMAN ON THE DEATH OF HIS LADY Where contemplation finds her sacred spring, Where heavenly music makes the arches ring, Where virtue reigns unsullied and divine, Where wisdom throned and all the graces shine, There sits thy spouse amidst the radiant throng, While praise eternal warbles from her tongue. There choirs angelic shout her welcome round, With perfect bliss and peerless glory crowned. While thy dear mate, to flesh no more confined, Exalts a blessed and heaven-ascended mind, Say, in thy breast shall floods of sorrow rise, Say, shall its torrents o'erwhelm thine eyes? Amid the seats of heaven a place is free, And angels open their bright ranks for thee, for thee they wait, and with expectant eye Thy spouse leans downward from the imperial sky. O oh, come away, her longing spirit cries, And share with me the raptures of the skies. Our bliss divine to mortals is unknown, Immortal life and glory are our own. There too may the dear pledges of our love arrive And taste with us the joys above. Attune the harp to more than mortal lays, and join with us the tribute of their praise To him who died stern justice to stone, And make eternal glory all our own. He in his death slew ours, And as he rose he crushed the dire dominion of our foes. 
Vain were their hopes to put the god to flight, Chain us to hell, and bar the gates of light. She spoke, and turned from mortal scenes her eyes, Which beamed celestial radiance o'er the skies. Then, thou dear man, no more with grief retire, Let grief no longer damp devotion's fire, But rise, sublime, to equal bliss aspire, Thy sighs no more be wafted by the wind, No more complain, but be to heaven resigned, Twas thine to unfold the oracles divine, To soothe our woes the task was also thine, Now sorrow is incumbent on thy heart, Permit the muse a cordial to impart, who can to thee their tenderest aid refuse? To dry thy tears, how longs the heavenly muse? End of section three. Section four of Poems on Various Subjects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Poems on Various Subjects. Religious and Moral by Phyllis Wheatley An Hymn to the Morning Attend my lays, ye ever-honoured nine, Assist my labours, and my strains refine. In smoothest numbers pour the notes along, For bright Aurora now demands my song. Aurora, hail, and all the thousand dies, which deck thy progress through the vaulted skies. The morn awakes, and wide extends her rays. On every leaf the gentle zephyr plays. Harmonious lays the feathered race resume, Dart the bright eye, and shake the painted plume. Ye shady groves, your verdant gloom display, To shield your poet from the burning day. Calliope, awake the sacred lyre, While thy fair sisters fan the pleasing fire. The bowers, the gales, the variegated skies, In all their pleasures in my bosom rise. See in the east the lustrous king of day, His rising radiance drives the shades away. But, oh, I feel his fervid beams too strong, And scarce begun concludes the abortive song. AN HYMN TO THE EVENING Soon as the sun forsook the eastern main, The pealing thunder shook the heavenly plain. Majestic grandeur! From the zephyr's wing Exhales the incense of the blooming spring. Soft purl the streams, the birds renew their notes, And through the air their mingled music floats. Through all the heavens what beauteous dyes are spread! But the west glories in the deepest red. So may our breasts with every virtue glow, The living temples of our God below. Filled with the praise of him who gives the light, And draws the sable curtains of the night, Let placid slumbers soothe each weary mind, At morn to wake more heavenly, more refined. So shall the labours of the day begin More pure, more guarded from the snares of sin. Night's leaden sceptre seals my drowsy eyes. Then cease my song, till fair Aurora rise. Isaiah 63, lines 1 to 8 Say, heavenly muse, what king or mighty god that moves sublime from Edumia's road? In Bosra's dyes with martial glories joined, his purple vesture waves upon the wind. Why thus enrobed delights he to appear in the dread image of the power of war? Compressed in wrath the swelling winepress groaned, it bled and poured the gushing purple round. Mine was the act, the almighty Saviour said, and shook the dazzling glories of his head. When all forsook I trod the press alone, And conquered by omnipotence my own. For man's release sustained the ponderous load, For man the wrath of an immortal god. To execute the eternal's dread command My soul I sacrificed with willing hand. Sinless I stood before the avenging frown, Atoning thus for vices not my own. 
His eye the ample field of battle round surveyed, but no created succours found. His own omnipotence sustained the right, his vengeance sunk the haughty foes in night. Beneath his feet the prostrate troops were spread, and round him lay the dying and the dead. Great God, what lightning flashes from thine eyes, what power withstands if thou indignant rise? Against thy Zion, though her foes may rage, and all their cunning, all their strength engage, yet she serenely on thy bosom lies, smiles at their arts, and all their force defies. On Recollection Nemi, begin, inspire, ye sacred nine, your venturous Afric in her great design. Nemi, immortal power, I trace thy spring. Assist my strains while I thy glories sing. The acts of long departed years, by thee recovered, in due order ranged we see. Thy power the long-forgotten calls from night, that sweetly plays before the fancy's sight. Nemi in our nocturnal visions pours the ample treasure of her secret stores. Swift from above the wings her silent flight through Phoebe's realms, fair regent of the night. And in her pomp of images displayed, to the high-raptured poet gives her aid. Through the unbounded regions of the mind, diffusing light celestial and refined. The heavenly phantom paints the actions done by every tribe beneath the rolling sun. Nemi, enthroned within the human breast, has vice condemned and every virtue blessed. How sweet the sound when we her plaudit hear! Sweeter than music to the ravished ear, sweeter than morrow's entertaining strains resounding through the groves and hills and plains. But how is Nemi dreaded by the race, Who scorn her warnings and despise her grace? By her unveiled each horrid crime appears, Her awful hand a cup of wormwood bears. Days, years misspent, oh, what a hell of woe! Hers the worst tortures that our souls can know. Now eighteen years their destined course have run, In fast succession round the central sun, how did the follies of that period pass unnoticed, but behold them writ in brass? In recollection see them fresh return, and short his mind to be ashamed and mourn. O virtue, smiling in immortal green, do thou exert thy power and change the scene. Be thine employ to guide my future days, and mine to pay the tribute of my praise. A recollection such the power enthroned in every breast, and thus her power is owned. The wretch who dared the vengeance of the skies at last awakes in horror and surprise. By her alarmed he sees impending fate, he howls in anguish and repents too late. But, oh, what peace, what joys are hers to impart to every holy, every upright heart! Thrice blessed the man, who in her sacred shrine Feels himself sheltered from the wrath divine. On Imagination Thy various works, imperial queen, we see, How bright their forms, how decked with pomp by thee. Thy wondrous acts in beauteous order stand, And all attest how potent is thine hand. From Helicon's refulgent heights attend, ye sacred choir, and my attempts befriend. To tell her glories with a faithful tongue, ye blooming graces, triumph in my song. Now here, now there, the roving fancy flies, till some loved object strikes her wandering eyes, whose silken fetters all the senses bind, and soft captivity involves the mind. Imagination who can sing thy force, or who describe the swiftness of thy course? Soaring through air to find the bright abode, the imperial palace of the thundering god, we on thy pinions can surpass the wind, and leave the rolling universe behind. From star to star the mental optics rove, 
measure the skies and range the realms above. There in one view we grasp the mighty whole, or with new worlds amaze the unbounded soul. Though winter frowns to fancy's raptured eyes, the fields may flourish and gay scenes arise. The frozen deeps may break their iron bands, and bid their waters murmur o'er the sands. Fair Flora may resume her fragrant reign, and with her flowery riches deck the plain. Sylvanus may diffuse his honours round, and all the forest may with leaves be crowned. Showers may descend, and dews their gems disclose, and nectar sparkle on the blooming rose. Such is thy power. Nor are thine orders vain, O thou the leader of the mental train. In full perfection all thy works are wrought, and thine the sceptre o'er the realms of thought. Before thy throne the subject passions bow, of subject passions sovereign ruler thou. At thy command joy rushes on the heart, and through the glowing veins the spirits dart. Fancy might now her silken pinions try to rise from earth and sweep the expanse on high. From Tython's bed now might Aurora rise, her cheeks all glowing with celestial dyes, while a pure stream of light o'erflows the skies. The monarch of the day I might behold, and all the mountains tipped with radiant gold. But I reluctant leave the pleasing views, which fancy dresses to delight the muse. Winter austere forbids me to aspire, and northern tempests damp the rising fire. They chill the tides of fancy's flowing sea. Cease then, my song, cease the unequal lay. A Funeral Poem On the Death of C. E., An Infant of Twelve Months through airy roads he wings his instant flight to purer regions of celestial light. Enlarged he sees unnumbered systems roll, beneath him sees the universal whole. Planets on planets run their destined round, and circling wonders fill the vast profound. The ethereal now and now the imperial skies with growing splendors strike his wondering eyes. The angels view him with delight unknown, press his soft hand, and seat him on his throne. Then, smiling thus, To this divine abode, the seat of angels, of seraphs, and of God, thrice welcome thou. The raptured babe replies, Thanks to my God, who snatched me to the skies, ere vice triumphant had possessed my heart, ere yet the tempter had beguiled my heart. Ere yet on sin's base actions I was bent, Ere yet I knew temptation's dire intent, Ere yet the lash for horrid crimes I felt, Ere vanity had led my way to guilt, But soon arrived at my celestial goal, Full glories rush on my expanding soul. Joyful he spoke, exulting cherubs round Clapped their glad wings, the heavenly vaults resound. Say, parents, why this unavailing moan? Why heave your pensive bosoms with the groan? To Charles, the happy subject of my song, A brighter world and nobler strains belong. Say, would you tear him from the realms above By thoughtless wishes and preposterous love? Doth his felicity increase your pain? Or could you welcome to this world again The air of bliss, with a superior air, methinks, he answers with a smile severe. Thrones and dominions cannot tempt me there. But still you cry, can we the sigh forbear, and still and still must we not pour the tear? Our only hope, more dear than vital breath, twelve moons revolved becomes the prey of death. Delightful infant, nightly visions give thee to our arms, and we with joy receive, we fain would clasp the phantom to our breast, the phantom flies and leaves the soul unblessed. To yon bright regions let your faith ascend, prepare to join your dearest infant friend, in pleasures without measure, without end. To Captain H. D. of the 65th Regiment Say, muse divine, 
Can hostile scenes delight the warrior's bosom in the fields of fight? Lo, here the Christian and the hero join with mutual grace to form the man divine. In H.D. see with pleasure and surprise, where valour kindles and where virtue lies. Go, hero brave, still grace the post of fame, and add new glories to thine honoured name. Still to the field, and still to virtue true, Britannia glories in no son like you. To the Right Honourable William, Earl of Dartmouth, His Majesty's Principal Secretary of State for North America, etc. Hail, happy day, when smiling like the morn, Fair freedom rose New England to adorn. The northern clime beneath her genial ray, Dartmouth congratulates thy blissful sway. Elate with hope her race no longer mourns, Each soul expands, each grateful bosom burns, While in thine hand with pleasure we behold The silken reins and freedom's charms unfold. Long lost to realms beneath the northern skies, She shines supreme, while hated faction dies. Soon as appeared the goddess long desired, Sick at the view, she languished and expired. Thus from the splendours of the morning light The owl in sadness seeks the caves of night. No more, America, in mournful strain Of wrongs and grievance unredressed complain. No longer shalt thou dread the iron chain, Which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made, And with it meant to enslave the land. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, Wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, Whence flow these wishes for the common good, By feeling hearts alone best understood, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, Was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, What sorrows labour in my parents' breast! Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? For favours past, great sir, our thanks are due, and thee we ask thy favours to renew, since in thy power, as in thy will before, to soothe the griefs which thou didst once deplore, may heavenly grace the sacred sanction give to all thy works, and thou for ever live, not only on the wings of fleeting fame, though praise immortal crowns the patriot's name, but to conduct to heaven's refulgent fane, may fiery coursers sweep the ethereal plain, and bear thee upwards to that blessed abode, where, like the prophet, thou shalt find thy God. End of section four. Section five of Poems on Various Subjects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, by Phyllis Wheatley. Ode to Neptune, on Mrs. W.'s Voyage to England. One. While raging tempests shake the shore, while Elis thunders round us roar, And sweep impetuous o'er the plain, Be still, O tyrant of the main, Nor let thy brow contracted frowns betray, While my Susanna skims the watery way. 2. The power propitious hears the lay, The blue-eyed daughters of the sea With sweeter cadence glide along, and Thames responsive joins the song. Pleased with their notes, Saul sheds benign his ray, and double radiance decks the face of day. 3. To court thee to Britannia's arms, serene the climes and mild the sky, her region boasts unnumbered charms, thy welcome smiles in every eye. Thy promise, Neptune, keep, Record my prayer, not give my wishes to the empty air. Boston, October twelfth, seventeen seventy two. 
to a lady on her coming to North America with her son for the recovery of her health. Indulgent muse, my groveling mind inspire, and fill my bosom with celestial fire. See from Jamaica's fervid shore she moves, like the fair mother of the blooming loves, when from above the goddess with her hand fans the soft breeze and lights upon the land. Thus she on Neptune's watery realm reclined, appeared, and thus invites the lingering wind. Arise, ye winds, America, explore, waft me, ye gales, from this malignant shore. The northern milder climes I long to greet, there hope that health will my arrival meet. Soon as she spoke in my ideal view, the winds assented and the vessel flew. Madam, your spouse bereft of wife and son, in the grove's dark recesses pours his moan. Each branch, wide-spreading to the ambient sky, forgets its verdure and submits to die. From thence I turn and leave the sultry plain, and swift pursue thy passage o'er the main. The ship arrives before the favouring wind, and makes the Philadelphian port assigned. Thence I attend you to Bostonian's arms, where generous friendship every bosom warms. Thrice welcome here, may health revive again, bloom on thy cheek and bound in every vein. Then back return to gladden every heart, and give your spouse his soul's far dearer part. Received again with what a sweet surprise, the tear in transport starting from his eyes, while his attendant son with blooming grace springs to his father's ever dear embrace. With shouts of joy Jamaica's rocks resound, with shouts of joy the country rings around. To a Lady on Her Remarkable Preservation in a Hurricane in North Carolina Though thou didst hear the tempest from afar, and felt the horrors of the watery war, to me unknown, Yet on this peaceful shore methinks I hear the storm tumultuous roar, and how stern Boreas with impetuous hand compelled the Nereids to usurp the land. Reluctant rose the daughters of the main, and slow ascending glided o'er the plain, till Aeolus in his rapid chariot drove in gloomy grandeur from the vault above. Furious he comes. His winged sons obey their frantic sire, and madden all the sea. The billows rave, the wind's fierce tyrant roars, and with his thundering terrors shakes the shores. Broken by waves the vessel's frame is rent, and strows with planks the watery element. But thee, Maria, a kind nearage shield preserved from sinking, and thy form upheld, and sure some heavenly oracle designed at that dread crisis to instruct thy mind things of eternal consequence to weigh, and to thine heart just feelings to convey of things above, and of the future doom, and what the births of the dread world to come. From tossing seas I welcome thee to land, resign her near it, was thy God's command, Thy spouse late buried as thy fears conceived, again returns, thy fears are all relieved. Thy daughter blooming with superior grace, again thou seest, again thine arms embrace. O oh, come, and joyful show thy spouse his heir, and what the blessings of maternal care. To a Lady and Her Children, on the Death of Her Son and Their Brother O'erwhelming sorrow now demands my song, From death the overwhelming sorrow sprung. What flowing tears, what hearts with grief oppressed, What sighs on sighs heave the fond parent's breast. The brother weeps, the hapless sisters join The increasing woe, and swell the crystal brine. The poor who once his generous bounty fed Droop, and bewail their benefactor dead. In death the friend, the kind companion lies, And in one death what various comfort dies. The unhappy mother sees the sanguine rill Forget to flow, and nature's wheels stand still. But see from earth his spirit far removed, And know no griefs recalls your best beloved. He, 
upon pinions swifter than the wind, has left mortality's sad scenes behind, for joys to this terrestrial state unknown, and glories richer than the monarch's crown. Of virtue's steady course the prize behold, what blissful wonders to his mind unfold! But of celestial joys I sing in vain, Attempt not, muse, the too adventurous strain. No more in briny showers, ye friends, around, Or bathe his clay, or waste them on the ground. Still do you weep, still wish for his return? How cruel thus to wish, and thus to mourn! No more for him the streams of sorrow pour, But haste to join him on the heavenly shore, On harps of gold to tune immortal lays, and to your God immortal anthems raise. To a gentleman and lady on the death of the lady's brother and sister, and a child of the name of Avis, aged one year. On death's domain intent I fix my eyes, where human nature in vast ruin lies. With pensive mind I search the drear abode where the great conqueror has his spoils bestowed. There, there the offspring of six thousand years in endless numbers to my view appears. Whole kingdoms in his gloomy den are thrust, and nations mix with their primeval dust. Insatiate still he gluts the ample tomb. His is the present, his the age to come. See here a brother, here a sister spread, and a sweet daughter mingled with the dead. But, madam, let your grief be laid aside, and let the fountain of your tears be dried. In vain they flow to wet the dusty plain. Your sighs are wafted to the skies in vain. Your pains they witness, but they can no more, while death reigns tyrant o'er this mortal shore. The glowing stars and silver queen of light at last must perish in the gloom of night. Resign thy friends to that almighty hand, which gave them life, and bow to his command. Thine Avis give without a murmuring heart, though half thy soul be fated to depart. To shining guards consign thine infant care, to waft triumphant through the seas of air. Her soul enlarged to heavenly pleasure springs, she feeds on truth and uncreated things. Methinks I hear her in the realms above, and leaning forward with a filial love invite you there to share immortal bliss unknown, untasted in a state like this. With towering hopes and growing grace arise, and seek beatitude beyond the skies. On the Death of Dr. Samuel Marshall, 1771 Through thickest glooms look back, immortal shade, On that confusion which thy death has made. Or from Olympus' height look down, and see A town involved in grief bereft of thee. Thy Lucy sees thee mingle with the dead, And rends the graceful tresses from her head. Wild in her woe, with grief unknown oppressed, Sigh follows sigh, deep heaving from her breast. Too quickly fled, ah, whither art thou gone? Ah, lost for ever to thy wife and son! The hapless child, thine only hope and heir, Clings round his mother's neck and weeps his sorrows there. The loss of thee on Tyler's soul returns, And Boston for her dear physician mourns. When sickness called for Marshall's healing hand, With what compassion did his soul expand? In him we found the father and the friend, In life how loved, how honoured in his end. And must not then our Aesculapius stay To bring his lingering infant into day? The babe unborn in the dark womb is lost, And seems in anguish for its father lost. Gone is Apollo from his house of earth, but leaves the sweet memorials of his worth, the common parent whom we all deplore, from yonder world unseen must come no more, yet midst our woes immortal hopes attend the spouse, the sire, the universal friend. To a gentleman on his voyage to Great Britain for the recovery of his health. While others chant of gay Elysian scenes, 
of balmy zephyrs and of flowery plains. My song more happy speaks a greater name, feels higher motives and a nobler flame. For thee, O R, the muse attunes her strings, and mounts sublime above inferior things. I sing not now of green embowering woods, I sing not now the daughters of the floods, I sing not of the storms o'er ocean driven, and how they howled along the waste of heaven. But I to R would paint the British shore, and vast Atlantic, not untried before. Thy life impaired commands thee to rise, leave these bleak regions and inclement skies, where chilling winds return the winter past, and nature shudders at the furious blast. O oh, thou stupendous, earth-enclosing main, exert thy wonders to the world again! If e'er thy power prolonged the fleeting breath, turned back the shafts and mocked the gates of death, if e'er thine air dispensed an healing power, or snatched the victim from the fatal hour, this equal case demands thine equal care, and equal wonders may this patient share. But unavailing, frantic is the dream, to hope thine aid without the aid of him who gave thee birth, and taught thee where to flow, and in thy waves his various blessings show. May R return to view his native shore, replete with vigour not his own before. Then shall we see with pleasure and surprise, and own thy work, great ruler of the skies. To the Rev. Dr. Thomas Amory on reading his sermons on daily devotion, in which that duty is recommended and assisted. To cultivate in every noble mind habitual grace and sentiments refined, thus while you strive to mend the human heart, thus while the heavenly precepts you impart, O oh, may each bosom catch the sacred fire, and youthful minds to virtue's throne aspire when in god's eternal ways you set in sight and virtue shines in all her native light in vain would vice her works in night conceal for wisdom's eye pervades the sable veil artists may paint the sun's effulgent rays but amory's pen the brighter god displays while his great works in amory's pages shine and while he proves his essence all divine the atheist, sure, no more can boast aloud of chance, or nature, and exclude the god. As if the clay without the potter's aid should rise in various forms, and shapes self-made, or worlds above with orb or orb profound, self-moved could run the everlasting round. It cannot be. Unerring wisdom guides with eye propitious, and o'er all presides. Still prosper, Amory! still mayst thou receive the warmest blessings which a muse can give. And when this transitory state is o'er, when kingdoms fall and fleeting fames no more, may Amory triumph in immortal fame, a nobler title and superior name. On the Death of J. C., an Infant No more the flowery scenes of pleasure rife, nor charming prospects greet the mental eyes, no more with joy we view that lovely face, Smiling, disportive, flushed with every grace. The tear of sorrow flows from every eye, Groans answer groans, and sighs to sighs reply. What sudden pang shot through each aching heart, When death thy messenger dispatched his dart? Thy dread attendants, all-destroying power, Hurried the infant to his mortal hour. Couldst thou unpitying close those radiant eyes, Or failed his artless beauties to surprise? Could not his innocence thy stroke control, Thy purpose shake and soften all thy soul? The blooming babe with shades of death o'erspread, No more shall smile, no more shall raise its head. But like a branch that from the tree is torn, Falls prostrate, withered, languid and forlorn. Where flies my James? Tis thus I seem to hear the parent ask. Some angel tell me where he wings his passage through the yielding air. Methinks a cherub bending from the skies observes the question, and serene replies, In heaven's high palaces your babe appears, 
prepare to meet him and dismiss your tears. Shall not the intelligence your grief restrain, and turn the mournful to the cheerful strain? Cease your complaints, suspend each rising sigh, cease to accuse the ruler of the sky. Parents, no more indulge the falling tear, let faith to heaven's refulgent domes repair. There see your infant like a seraph glow, what charms celestial in his numbers flow melodious, while the foul enchanting strain dwells on his tongue and fills the ethereal plain. Enough! For ever cease your murmuring breath, not as a foe, but friend converse with death. Since to the port of happiness unknown he brought that treasure which you call your own. The gift of heaven entrusted to your hand, cheerful resign at the divine command. Not at your bar must sovereign wisdom stand. An Hymn to Humanity To S. P. G. Esquire 1. Lo! For this dark terrestrial ball forsakes his azure paved hall, a prince of heavenly birth, divine humanity behold, what wonders rise, what charms unfold at his descent to earth. 2. The bosoms of the great and good with wonder and delight he viewed, and fixed his empire there, him close compressing to his breast the sire of gods and men addressed, my son, my heavenly fair. 3. Descend to earth, there place thy throne, to succour man's afflicted son each human heart inspire, to act in bounties unconfined, enlarge the close contracted mind, and fill it with thy fire. 4. Quick is the word, with swift career he wings his course from star to star, and leaves the bright abode. The virtue did his charms impart, their God, then thy raptured heart perceived the rushing God. 5. For when thy pitying eye did see the languid muse in low degree, then, then at thy desire descended the celestial nine, or me methought they deigned to shine, and deigned to string my lyre. 6. Can Afric's muse forgetful prove? Or can such friendship fail to move a tender human heart? Immortal friendship laurel crowned, the smiling graces all surround with every heavenly art. To the Honourable T. H. Esquire, on the death of his daughter. While deep you mourn beneath the cypress shade, the hand of death and your dear daughter laid in dust, whose absence gives your tears to flow, and racks your bosom with incessant woe, let recollection take a tender part, assuage the raging tortures of your heart, still the wild tempest of tumultuous grief, and pour the heavenly nectar of relief. Suspend the sigh, dear sir, and check the groan, divinely bright your daughter's virtues shone. How free from scornful pride her gentle mind, which ne'er its aid to indigence declined! Expanding free, it sought the means to prove unfailing charity, unbounded love. She reluctant flies to see no more her dear-loved parents on earth's dusky shore. Impatient heaven's resplendent goal to gain, she with swift progress cuts the azure plain, where grief subsides, where changes are no more, and life's tumultuous billows cease to roar. She leaves her earthly mansion for the skies, where new creations feast her wondering eyes. To heaven's high mandate cheerfully resigned she mounts, and leaves the rolling globe behind. She who late wished that Leonard might return, has ceased to languish, and forgot to mourn. To the same high imperial mansions come, she joins her spouse, and smiles upon the tomb. And thus I hear her from the realms above, Lo, this the kingdom of celestial love! Could ye, fond parents, see our present bliss, How soon would you each sigh, each fear dismiss? Amidst unuttered pleasures whilst I play In the fair sunshine of celestial day, As far as grief affects an happy soul, So far doth grief my better mind control. 
to see on earth my aged parents mourn, and secret wish for tea to return. Let brighter scenes your evening hours employ, converse with heaven, and taste the promised joy. Niobe in distress for her children slain by Apollo. From Ovid's Metamorphosis, Book Six, and from a view of the painting of Mr. Richard Wilson. Apollo's wrath to man the dreadful spring of ills innumerous, tuneful goddess, sing. Thou who didst first the ideal pencil give, and taught the painter in his works to live, inspire with glowing energy of thought what Wilson painted and what Ovid wrote. Muse, lend thine aid, nor let me sue in vain, though last and meanest of the rhyming train. O guide my pen in lofty strains to show the Phrygian queen all beautiful in woe. Twas where Meonia spreads her wide domain, Niobe dwelt, and held her potent reign. See in her hand the regal sceptre shine, the wealthy heir of Tantalus divine, her most distinguished by Dodenian Jove, to approach the tables of the gods above. Her grandsire Atlas, who with mighty pains the ethereal axis on his neck sustains. Her other grandsire on the throne on high rolls the loud pealing thunder through the sky. Her spouse, Amphion, who from Jove too springs, divinely taught to sweep the sounding strings. Seven sprightly sons the royal bed adorn, seven daughters beauteous as the opening morn, as when Aurora fills the ravished sight and decks the orient realms with rosy light, from their bright eyes the living splendours play, nor can beholders bear the flashing ray. Wherever, Niobe, thou turn'st thine eyes, new beauties kindle and new joys arise. But thou hadst far the happier mother proved, if this fair offspring had been less beloved. What if their charms exceed Aurora's taint? No words could tell them, and no pencil paint. Thy love too vehement hastens to destroy Each blooming maid, and each celestial boy. Now Manto comes, endued with mighty skill, The past to explore, the future to reveal. Through Thebes' wide streets Tiresia's daughter came, Divine Latona's mandate to proclaim. The Theban maids to hear the orders ran, When thus Meonius' prophetess began. Go, Thebans, great Latona's will obey, and pious tribute at her altars pay, with rites divine the goddess be implored, nor be her sacred offspring unadored. Thus Manto spoke. The Theban maids obey, and pious tribute to the goddess pay. The rich perfumes ascend in waving spires, the altars blaze with consecrated fires, the fair assembly moves with graceful air, and leaves of laurel bind the flowing hair. Niobe comes with all her royal race, with charms unnumbered and superior grace. Her Phrygian garments of delightful hue, inwove with gold refulgent to the view. Beyond description beautiful she moves, like heavenly Venus, midst her smiles and loves. She views around the supplicating train, and shakes her graceful head with stern disdain. Proudly she turns around her lofty eyes, and thus reviles celestial deities. What madness drives the Theban ladies fair to give their incense to surrounding air? Say why this new-sprung deity preferred? Why vainly fancy your petitions heard? Or say, why Caius' offspring is obeyed, while to my goddess-ship no tribute's paid? For me no altars blaze with living fires, no bullock bleeds, no frankincense transpires, Though Cadmus' palace, not unknown to fame, And Phrygian nations all revere my name, Where'er I turn my eyes, vast wealth I find. Lo, here an empress with a goddess joined. What, shall a titaness be deified, To whom the spacious earth a couch denied? Nor heaven, nor earth, nor sea received your queen, Till pitying Delos took the wanderer in. Round me what a large progeny is spread, no frowns of fortune has my soul to dread. What if indignant she decrease my train, More than Latona's number will remain? Then hence, ye Theban dames, hence haste away, No longer offerings to Latona pay. Regard the orders of Amphion's spouse, And take the leaves of laurel from your brows. 
Niobe spoke. The Theban maids obeyed, their brows unbound, and left the rites unpaid. The angry goddess heard, then silence broke on Synthus summit, and indignant spoke. Phoebus, behold, thy mother in disgrace, who to no goddess yields the prior place, except to Juno's self who reigns above, the spouse and sister of the thundering Jove. Niobe, sprung from Tantalus, inspires each Theban bosom with rebellious fires. No reason her imperious temper quells, but all her father in her tongue rebels. Wrap her own sons for her blaspheming breath. Apollo, wrap them in the shades of death. Latona ceased, and ardent thus replies the god whose glory decks the expanded skies. Cease thy complaints. Mine be the task assigned to punish pride and scourge the rebel mind. This Phoebe joined. They wing their instant flight. Thebes trembled as the mortal powers alight. With clouds encompassed glorious Phoebus stands, the feathered vengeance quivering in his hands. Near Cadmus' walls a plain extended lay, where Thebes' young princes passed in sport the day. There the bold coursers bounded o'er the plains, while their great masters held the golden reins. Ismenus first the racing pastime led, and ruled the fury of his flying steed. Ah, me! he sudden cries, with shrieking breath, while in his breast he feels the shaft of death. He drops the bridle on his courser's mane, before his eyes in shadow swims the plain. He, the first-born of great Amphion's bed, was struck the first, first mingled with the dead. Then didst thou, Sipolus, the language here of fate portentous whistling in the air, as when the impending storm the sailor sees, he spreads his canvas to the favouring breeze. So to thine horse thou gavest the golden reins, gavest him to rush impetuous o'er the plains. But ah, a fatal shaft from Phoebus' hand smites through thy neck, and sinks thee on the sand. Two other brothers were at wrestling found, and in their pastime clasped each other round. A shaft that instant from Apollo's hand transfixed them both, and stretched them on the sand. Together they their cruel fate bemoaned, together languished and together groaned. Together too the unbodied spirits fled, and sought the gloomy mansions of the dead. Alphenor saw, and trembling at the view, beat his torn breast that changed its snowy hue. He flies to raise them in a kind embrace, a brother's fondness triumphs in his face. Alphenor fails in this fraternal deed, a dart dispatched him, so the fates decreed. Soon as the arrow left the deadly wound, his issuing entrails smoked upon the ground. What woes on blooming Damascian wait! His sighs portend his near impending fate. Just where the well-made leg begins to be, and the soft sinews form the supple knee, the youth sore wounded by the Dalian god attempts to extract the crime-avenging rod. But whilst he strives the will of fate to avert, divine Apollo sends a second dart. Swift through his throat the feathered mischief flies, bereft of sense he drops his head and dies. Young Ilioneus, the last, directs his prayer, and cries, My life, ye god celestial, spare! Apollo heard, and pity touched his heart, but ah, too late, for he had sent the dart. Thou too, O Ilioneus, art doomed to fall, the fates refuse that arrow to recall. On the swift wings of ever-flying fame to Cadmus' palace soon the tidings came, Niobe heard, and with indignant eyes she thus expressed her anger and surprise. Why is such privilege to them allowed? Why thus insulted by the Dalian god? Dwells there such mischief in the powers above? Why sleeps the vengeance of a mortal Jove? For now Amphion too, with grief oppressed, had plunged the deadly dagger in his breast. Niobe, now less haughty than before, with lofty head directs her steps no more, she who late told her pedigree divine, and drove the Thebans from Latona's shrine, how strangely changed! Yet beautiful in woe, she weeps, nor weeps unpitied by the foe. On each pale course the wretched mother spread, lay overwhelmed with grief, and kissed her dead. Then raised her arms, and thus in accent slow, 
Be sated, cruel goddess, with my woe. If I've offended, let these streaming eyes, And let this sevenfold funeral suffice. Ah, take this wretched life you deigned to save, With them I too am carried to the grave. Rejoice, triumphant, my victorious foe, But show the cause from whence your triumphs flow. Though I unhappy mourn these children slain, Yet greater numbers to my lot remain. She ceased. The bowstring twanged with awful sound, Which struck with terror all the assembly round, Except the queen, who stood unmoved alone, By her distresses more presumptuous grown. Near the pale courses stood their sisters fair In sable vestures and dishevelled hair. One, while she draws the fatal shaft away, Faints, falls, and sickens at the light of day. To soothe her mother, lo, another flies, and blames the fury of inclement skies, and while her words of filial pity show, struck dumb, indignant seeks the shades below. Now from the fatal place another flies, falls in her flight, and languishes and dies. Another on her sister drops in death, a fifth in trembling terrors yields her breath, while the sixth seeks some gloomy cave in vain, struck with the rest and mingled with the slain. Only one daughter lives, and she the least. The queen close clasped the daughter to her breast. Ye heavenly powers, ah, spare me one, she cried. Ah, spare me one, the vocal hills replied. In vain she begs, the fates her suit deny. In her embrace she sees her daughter die. The queen of all her family bereft, Without husband, son, or daughter left, Grew stupid at the shock. The passing air made no impression on her stiffening hair. The blood forsook her face, amidst the flood poured from her cheeks quite fixed her eyeballs stood. Her tongue, her palate both obdurate grew, her curdled veins no longer motion knew. The use of neck and arms and feet was gone, and even her bowels hardened into stone. A marble statue now the queen appears, but from the marble steel the silent tears. End of section 5《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
and pure language on the ethereal plain. Cease, gentle muse, the solemn gloom of night now seals the fair creation from my sight. To his honour the lieutenant-governor, on the death of his lady, March twenty-fourth, 1773. All conquering death! By thy resistless power, Hope's towering plumage falls to rise no more. Of scenes terrestrial how the glories fly, Forget their splendours, and submit to die. Who e'er escaped thee, but the saint of old, Beyond the flood in sacred annals told? And the great sage, whom fiery coursers drew To heaven's bright portals from Alicia's view? Wondering he gazed at the refulgent car, then snatched the mantle floating in the air. From death these only could exemption boast, and without dying gained the mortal coast. Not falling millions sate the tyrant's mind, nor can the victor's progress be confined. But cease thy strife with death, fond nature, cease! He leads the virtuous to the realms of peace. His to conduct to the immortal plains, where heaven supreme in bliss and glory reigns. There sits, illustrious sir, thy beauteous spouse, a gem-blazed circle beaming on her brows, hailed with acclaim among the heavenly choirs, her soul new kindling with seraphic fires. Two notes divine she tunes the vocal strings, while heaven's high concave with the music rings. Virtue's rewards can mortal pencil paint? No, all descriptive arts and eloquence are faint. Nor canst thou, Oliver, assent refuse To heavenly tidings from the Afric muse. As soon may change thy law's eternal fate, As the saints miss the glories I relate. Or her benevolence forgotten lie, Which wiped the trickling tear from misery's eye, When e'er the adverse winds were known to blow, when loss to loss ensued and woe to woe, calm and serene beneath her father's hand she sat resigned to the divine command. No longer then, great sir, her death deplore, and let us hear the mournful sign no more. Restrain the sorrow streaming from thine eye, be all thy future moments crowned with joy, nor let thy wishes be to earth confined, but soaring high pursue the unbodied mind. Forgive the muse, forgive the adventurous lays, That fain thy soul to heavenly scenes would raise. A Farewell to America To Mrs. S. W. Adieu, New England's smiling meads, Adieu, the flowery plain, I leave thine opening charms, O spring, And tempt the roaring main. In vain for me the flowerets rise, And boast their gaudy pride, While here beneath the northern skies I mourn for health denied. Celestial maid of rosy hue, O oh, let me feel thy reign! I languish till thy face I view, Thy vanished joys regain. Susanna mourns, nor can I bear To see the crystal shower, Or mark the tender falling tear At sad departure's hour. Not unregarding can I see her soul with grief oppressed, But let no sighs, no groans for me steal from her pensive breast. In vain the feathered warblers sing, in vain the garden blooms, And on the bosom of the spring breathes out her sweet perfumes. While for Britannia's distant shore we sweep the liquid plain, And with astonished eyes explore the wide extended main. Lo! Health appears, celestial dame, complacent and serene, with Hebe's mantle o'er her frame, with soul delighting mien. To mark the vale where London lies with misty vapours crowned, which cloud Aurora's thousand dyes and veil her charms around. Why, Phoebus, moves thy car so slow, so slow thy rising ray? Give us the famous town to view, thou glorious king of day. For thee, Britannia, I resign New England's smiling fields, To view again her charms divine, what joy the prospect yields. But thou, temptation, hence away, with all thy fatal train, 
nor once seduce my soul away by thine enchanting strain. Thrice happy they, whose heavenly shield secures their souls from harms, and fell temptation on the field of all its power disarms. Boston, May 7, 1773 Arebus by I. B. 1. A bird delicious to the taste, on which an army once did feast, sent by an hand unseen, a creature of the horned race, which Britain's royal standards grace, a gem of vivid green. 2. A town of gaiety and sport, where bows and beauteous nymphs resort, and gallantry doth reign, a Darden hero famed of old, for youth and beauty as were told, and by a monarch slain. 3. A peer of popular applause, Who doth our violated laws And grievances proclaim. The initials show a vanquished town That adds fresh glory and renown To old Britannia's fame. An Answer to the Rebus By the author of these poems. The poet asks, and Phyllis can't refuse, To show the obedience of the infant muse. She knows the quail of most inviting taste, Fed Israel's army in the dreary waste. And what's on Britain's royal standard born But the tall, graceful, rampant unicorn? The emerald with a vivid verdure glows Among the gems with regal crowns compose. Boston's a town polite and debonair, To which the bows and beauteous nymphs repair. Each Helen strikes the mind with sweet surprise, while living lightning flashes from her eyes. See, young Euphorbus of the Darden line, by Manelaus' hand to death resign. The well-known peer of popular applause is C. M. zealous to support our laws. Quebec, now vanquished, must obey. She too much annual tribute pay to Britain of immortal fame, and add new glory to her name. End of section six. End of poems on various subjects, religious and moral, by Phyllis Wheatley. Read for LibriVox.org in October two thousand eleven by Elizabeth Clatt.